Amen. It is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, so good to see uh, so many wonderful friends. Um, some of you are getting older. I'm getting younger. We, when we have guests, I go tell them I'm senior pastor, and I've got a pastor that's getting ready to take over the church, and I go back, and I say, we have a young pastor and an old pastor, and I'm the young one. So, but uh, it is it's wonderful to be here with Brother and Sister Woodward. Um, appreciate these folks so very much. In fact, Brother Woodward's going to be at our district conference in just a few weeks in a terrible place to have it, Myrtle Beach. <coughs> it's a real trial to come to places like that. Amen. <laughs> Brother and Sister Foster, so good to see you, my friend. Amen. Uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. Uh, and uh, Brother and Sister Arbo, good to see you folks. Of course, my friends, Brother and Sister Calhoun back there, uh, tremendous to have them. And I saw Brother Mills opening the door outside for everybody to come in, and it's so great. Somebody said, do you miss New Brunswick? I don't miss that snow, and I don't miss that cold, but I sure do miss all of you. <laughs> All of the wonderful, wonderful fellowship that we had here in this district. So it's just great to be with you. There's one more person watching that I do need to acknowledge. My granddaughter Haley is watching. And uh, Haley, I'm looking forward to next Sunday when I get to baptize you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. She just received the Holy Ghost a few weeks ago, and she wants Papa the baptizer so we're going to do that Sunday amen and that's wonderful we're just so thrilled and excited with that amen amen well glory a few weeks ago you could be seated a moment uh, a few weeks ago I was uh, traveling in our district and I we had just done some licensing seminars and then I had driven down to Charleston to uh, visit with uh, brother Victor Melendez uh, he has Lou Gehrig's disease, one of our great Hispanic pastors and ministers. And I was down there visiting. So I was coming back late. And on the way back to Anderson, there's a, there's a rest stop in the median. And uh, you, you can come in from both sides. And so it was quite late. There wasn't very many people around. And I, I pulled in there. And I was in the restroom. And I came out. And um, I, I wasn't watching where I was going. And there was a an edge on the sidewalk. It just dropped off. And I wasn't paying any attention. And my foot caught right on the edge of it. And I twisted my ankle. And I went flying through the air. I, I mean, I just did a flip in the air. Came and rolled. Got down, rolled. Somehow or another, when I stopped, I was sitting in a pool of dirt facing the opposite direction that I had been walking. And there was a black man that was cleaning the restroom. He just happened to walk out just as I went flying through the air. And so he ran over. He says, are you all right? I said, I'm checking. And uh, I, I had blood coming through my knee where I'd scraped it in the whole thing. But anyway, I carry a little vial of anointing oil. Somehow or another, when I was doing the flip, it fell out of my coat. I wasn't dressed up in a suit or anything. And uh, so he comes running over. And you remember, his first view of me is me flying in the air. He sees the vial of oil and he picks it up. He said, sir, are you a preacher? And I said, well, yes, I am. Most dignified, you know. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just laying there, hands on the side, legs straight out. What hair I've got's messed up, Everything. And he said, I knew it. As soon as I saw you, there was something different about you. <laughs> I, uh, I told our young preachers, we had about four of them get licensed, and I told them the next day, I said, now I'm going to tell you when you've arrived, when you can go flying through the air and come down facing the other direction and you are totally and absolutely not a person that would be respected at all, and somebody says, I knew there was something different about you. I said, then you'll know the anointing has been upon you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What a life we lead, isn't it? Amen. If you'll stand now for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version. <clears throat> 
says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Verse 31. This is after the woman with the issue of blood had touched him. And the disciples said, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? And then verses 35 and 36. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said. Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, I hope this is not sacrilegious to say this, but here's the title of my message. I don't care. I don't care. Would you turn to someone by you and just say, I don't care. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Most of us are familiar with this story, and Jesus was on his way to a miracle at Jairus' house when his, he was interrupted by another need. Now, I, I, that's always intrigued me that when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus and stopped the procession and everything stopped, how anxious Jairus must have been because they were supposed to be on the way to his house and his daughter was dying and he needed, he needed a touch. But this woman with an issue of blood needed healing and she received it. I'm sure that it was frustrating to Jairus, but even more so and more discouraging was the message from his friends that arrived at that particular moment and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the master any further. You know, on your way to a miracle, there will always be someone with discouraging words trying to detour the miracle, the answer to your dilemma. Always. And I love the way the NIV puts it, speaking of Jesus ignoring what they said. And I'm just putting that in my vernacular, in today's English. Instead of just saying, ignoring what they said, I think he just said, I don't care what you say. I, I, I just don't care what you say. I, I, I don't care what the report is. Don't be afraid, just believe. Now, when I, I talk about this, I am saying that I believe that I'm talking to someone, and I want to have this word for you. Pay no attention to faith-killing voices trying to steal your miracle, your answer, your help, your joy. I don't care what you say. I will ignore it. Pardon me. I'm on my way to a miracle. Pardon me, I'm on my way to a miracle. Hallelujah. There's a cacophony of voices that come in to our lives from every direction. And, and all of those voices have significance. And somehow or another, you've got to block out those things that would take our faith away, that would put us down into depression and say, listen, I just don't care. I believe I'm going to see my miracle. Anytime you pursue God for something, count on having to meet some prophets of doom and gloom. You're going to have some adversaries out there who, who, who will hound you to try to take away your faith. What do you think you're doing? Don't trouble the master any further. Your daughter is dead. Faith killing voices. Some come from the failures of yesterday. Some come from the doubts of tomorrow, and some come from the pessimism of today. When you begin to think, I, it's always going to be like this. It's never going to change. Nothing is ever going to get 
any better. My marriage will never, ever be what it needs to be. That child that's walked away from God, I'll never see them come back. When you hear those voices coming at you, stop for just a moment. And I just, I don't want to be arrogant in this, but I am sick and tired of the enemy speaking to us and us listening to what he's got to say. Somebody needs to stand up to him and say, I don't care. I don't care what you say. I don't care what kind of discouraging message you put out to me. I have a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we would even think or ask. I just don't care. Mm. She's dead. There's nothing he can do. You can have the testimony of the faithless. And the testimony of the faith that somehow they don't know or realize who Jesus is, nor his power. Notice something else here, which is amazing to me. They are all telling him this <laughs> while a miracle is standing right there in front of them. The woman with the issue of blood is healed. And, and so a miracle is standing right there facing them. And here they are still negatively speaking with little faith, no faith, trying to take us down the same road. Listen, I've seen too many miracles. I've seen too many things happen with God. Amen. I've seen and experienced too much. Don't tell me what God can't do because I'd like to tell you what God can do. I'd rather say God can than can God. I wish we had changed the way we think. We begin to say, can God do this? Can God heal this? Can God step into this situation? Nobody's got a situation like this. Why don't we just stop saying, can God, and change it around, just switch it around. God can step into this situation. God can change this. God can step into something that I didn't think anybody else was going through. God can. I was uh, in a conference last week with Brother Hattaball from Florida, and um, he is an amazing man to be around. Um, we, they, they call him Happy Hattaball. He, he just he smiles all the time, and he worships all the time. Doesn't matter whether he's preaching or not, but he, 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 he's a uh, chaplain for the police force down where he's at in Florida. And so... They put them through the same training that they give police officers because if a chaplain has to come onto a crime scene, they don't want him messing up any of the evidence, so they have to learn what they have to do. So put him in this class for CSI, which none of you knows what that means. And uh, so uh, anyway, he said he was sitting there, and the, the director of this doctor is explaining forensics and all of this. And the doctor, Hadball said... I just could hardly sit there. He said, they, they just had me. I was ready to stand up and shout. Because the doctor said, when we are on a crime scene, the blood speaks to us. Whew. I'd get excited too. And they just need a drop of blood. They don't need a lot. Just a drop of blood. Hallelujah. You know, that, that, that just speaks volumes to me because the blood still speaks. The blood still speaks. Hallelujah. It speaks of wonderful things and better things. Hallelujah. And, and whatever you go through, whatever your situation is, whatever your background is, it doesn't matter where you're coming from. Just the blood of Jesus applied to your life. It speaks redemption into your soul and spirit and body. Hallelujah. 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 And if a little drop of blood is all they need to see the DNA and everything else, what? how much blood do you need of Jesus? Hallelujah. It's powerful. It's mighty. 
Hallelujah. It's been flowing for 2,000 years and it has never lost its power. Something else that was said. The photographer for the police department is a former photographer for the royal family. And so the photographer was talking to Brother Hadabal. Because Brother Hadabal by this time is pretty wound up about blood and all this stuff. And so the photographer says, maybe you didn't know this. He said, but when I traveled with the royal family, he said, when they left, we went to Africa on some kind of safari. He said, before they leave, it's all planned out. They give their blood. And the blood is taken with them. And it's under lock and key and refrigerated. And said, because if there is an accident, the royal family is not to receive a transfusion from anyone else because it will corrupt the royal bloodline. You and I have got some raw blood flowing through our veins. When you play around with this world, when you begin to do things you should not do, you're transfusing into that blood sub-foreign contaminant because the doctor said at that same seminar that if you've received a transfusion of someone else's blood, it begins to mess the whole DNA situation up because you've got somebody else's blood flowing through your veins. I thank God that I've got royal blood flowing through my vein. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what they try to discourage me with. We've got a blood that has never lost its power. And when it's applied to your life, uh, everything is turned around and changed by the authority and power of the blood of Jesus Christ. How long has it been since we heard plead the blood? I plead the blood. I plead the blood. That's an old-fashioned term, but I'm going to tell you it's got as much power today as it's ever had. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so don't tell me what God can't do. I've seen an experience too much, and the power of an argument is never as strong as an experience. Hallelujah. <laughs> Faith killing voices have affected many. Elijah started running when he heard that Jezebel was out to get him. She just voiced a threat. It's, it's hard to imagine that he's coming from the triumphant, wonderful power of victory over the prophets of Baal, and then he is faced with this threat, and he runs. But it is somewhat normal for us, if we really think about it, is that when we come down off of our mountains of great experiences, that that's sometimes the worst moments in our lives when the enemy steps in. And that's what happened to him. And that voice of threat began to be negatively worked upon him, and he began to run away from all of that. It was a faith-killing voice. Amen. Jezebel's death threat. Eve in the garden listened to the serpent who was a faith-killing voice. Jacob and looked at the bloody coat of Joseph. It wasn't the end of the story, but he didn't realize it. He just listened to the negative content. He just assumed that the blood was the blood of his son and that he had been taken by some wild animal. It was a faith-killing voice. Saul listened to Goliath's challenge and hid behind the bunkers, so to speak, because of the faith-killing voices. But listen, my friend, others said, I don't care. I want my miracle. When David looked at Goliath and everybody said he's big, he said the bigger they are, the harder they fall. He was not intimidated by the faith-killing voice that said, send me a man. A boy went out there and did the job of a man because he had faith that God can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
John was on the Isle of Patmos and everybody thought that he was going to just go into discouragement in there. But he said, here I am all alone. Here I am isolated by everybody else. But I believe this is the Lord's day and I think I'll pray and I'll get into the spirit on the Lord's day. I'm not going to let a negative voice stop me. I don't care if I'm on this island alone. I don't care if I'm going through all of this. I'm going to worship my God anyway. Jesus walks up to the tomb and they say, oh, by now he stinketh. He said, I don't care. I don't care. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. <laughs> Blind Bartimaeus and his friend. You know, so many are unnamed in the Bible, so Bartimaeus must have come from some kind of a background that his name would be mentioned. But you know the story. They cried out. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they, they, they hollered it loud. And all of the friends around were saying, be quiet, be quiet. Don't bother him. You know what they said? I don't care. I don't care. And it said the second time they got louder than they were at the first time. That really bothered the crowd. And they went back to him the second time and they said, hey, we told you to be quiet. Can't see nothing. I don't care. You know, you know what they really wanted to say? Who's blind here? You're not blind. We're the ones that are blind, and we don't care what you say. We're seeking for a miracle, and we are not going to be detoured from our miracle. Interesting thing about that story, it says that they threw off the garments to run to Jesus. You know Why? Because the garments identified them as the blind. Faith was right there when they said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he stopped. Hallelujah. They took off the identifying mark and said, I'm not going to be blind any longer. I don't care what you say. I'm going to get my sight. I'm telling you there's somebody in this house tonight that needs to say, I don't care. I don't care what the doctor's report says. I don't care what the x-ray says. I don't care what the MRI says. I'm going to tell you something. The guy, I just don't care because my faith is in my God. Peter walking on the water. He began to sink. All of his good friends, you know, the other 11. Pals, buddies. <laughs> I love Peter because he just reminds me so much of myself. Which gives me hope. <laughs> but, 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 he, but, but he goes out and, and he, he's walking on the water and all of a sudden he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink. And Jesus has to come. And, and pick him up by the hand and pull him up. And interesting. How'd they get back to the boat? I think when Jesus grabbed his hand and picked him up, they walked together back to the boat. And so while his friends are going, oh, he's, you know what he's saying? I don't care. Look where I've come from. I might have been sinking, but I was walking for a while and you haven't even tried. I don't care. Listen, young people, when you want to serve God, you, when you want to step out by faith, when you want to do something for God and your friends, your peers try to discourage you, just say, I don't care. I don't care. Hallelujah. They're, you're going to go into your high schools. Your high schools are going to try to tell you all of these things. Just say, I don't care. I am not moved. I am not affected by the peer pressure. I don't care what you say. I've got a Jesus that's powerful and mighty. He's able to do everything that I need. Hallelujah. I just don't care. And so then you come to, you know, friends that were tearing off the rope to let the paralyzed companion down to Jesus. I don't think that was really kosher. I don't think that was the thing to do to be tearing somebody's roof up. So I'm assuming that somebody probably said something to them negatively about tearing the roof off. And they just looked down from the top of the roof and said, I don't care. We've got to get this guy to Jesus. Mm. I wish there were more of us who just didn't care, but we've got to get somebody to Jesus. Hallelujah. 
I, I was I was pastoring in Langley, British Columbia, home missions work, and and we had a mighty mighty move of God in two weekends. We had Brother John McDonald with us, and I think we had sixteen get the Holy Ghost. This is a little home missions church, and one of them was my son. Uh, in that weekend, and we just had a powerful move of God, and these were all brand new converts, a majority of them, and they believed everything you told them. I, I didn't realize that until, you know, but I had told them that Jesus heals. Okay, they believed it. So one service, I look back, and here they bring this lady in. She's on these brace crutches. And I went back to greet them, and the my, my, the new converts that I had that had brought her, they were just smiling from ear to ear. We brought her to be healed tonight. Guess who had the doubt? I was going, oh, boy. What's going to happen here? And, and what, what, what's going to happen to the faith if, if she's not healed? What, what, what's going to go on? It, it's one thing to preach something. It's another thing to be confronted with it and believe it. So, man, all the way through that service, through the worship service, I, I, my mind was just flowing in turmoil. And I'm looking at my message that I've got to preach and say, well, if this, is this going to fit? I need a miracle here tonight. You know, God, you've got to do something. And, 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 and nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. I get done preaching, and the altar service gets to go on, and they're playing the, the little keyboard we had, and the Holy Ghost began to move. And I'm, I'm still worried, just worried sick. And all of a sudden, I look back in the middle of the aisle, and the lady has slung those crutches away. She is dancing in the aisle. Dancing in the aisle. Now, in this place, in this place, is there anybody who can believe in God and say, I don't care what the negative voices are saying. My Jesus is able and capable of doing whatever I need. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, oh don't, don't, don't let these faith, this fear generate, I mean, you know, voices stop Jesus before he gets to the place of need. In fact, you may have to do what Jesus did. When he got to Jerry's house, all the mourners were there. And he said, she's just sleeping. And, and mourners are the professional mourners, okay? The professional mourners. That's what they did in Israel. They brought people in that were professional mourners who wept and wailed and all of this. And they began to laugh. And here's what Jesus said. I don't care. Get out. Get out. I will not listen to any faithless voices. I'm going to get everybody out. And in that moment when they left, he reached down and that young lady rose up alive. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to get that same kind of attitude in your life right now I don't care what the voices have said I don't care what the negatives have said I want you to get out of my life right now I'm going to believe I'm not going to be afraid but I'm going to believe prognosis isn't very good but I don't care I will believe it will always be this way no 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 I don't care um, I, I can't go to the altar tonight no I don't care I will go to the altar tonight I've been there before I've been prayed for before but I don't care I'm going to go again I'm just not going to stop I'm not going to give up I'm going to continue on seeking after God if God was going to do it he would have already done it no 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 I will not listen to that voice I will seek God again and again and again and again I'm on my way to a miracle and don't get in my way because I just don't care Some people will tell you, don't bother the master now. It's all over. I got news for you. I, I, I don't care what you say. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody needs to get an I don't care attitude. I just don't care. 
I said, I just don't care. I haven't told very many people this. But several years ago, it's been quite a few years ago now. I had gone to the doctor and they had given me the test for prostate cancer and such. And they were determined that I had it. And so in St. John, there was a doctor there. I cannot remember his name now, but he was quite famous all over the world. And he had invented some of the procedures to take care of prostate cancer. So they scheduled me to go up there. Well, we were going to a midwinter home missions board meeting. And uh, when things like that, I'm, I'm kind of private about. I, I don't say a lot, but there was a man from Arkansas there. He was not a, you know, well-known or anything like that. Just, and we were sitting together, and the, they'd gone into prayer in the home missions service. And I, I leaned over to him, and I said, I have got to go to a, a cancer doctor, specialist in prostate cancer. And I said, they are convinced that I have prostate cancer. I said, I need you to pray for me right now. This man, again, I don't even remember his name now. But this man reached over and began to pray for me, and I felt something just flow through my body. And it was a couple of weeks later that I went to the, the office in uh, the hospital there, what, not, not the main one, what's the one downtown? St. Joseph's. I went down there, went to see this doctor, and uh, ran into R.A. Beasley when I was up there, and he said, what are you doing here? I said, ah, oh, just getting a checkup. <laughs> I wasn't going to tell nobody. And the doctor did this test that he does. And he got down and he said, I don't understand why your doctor even sent you to me. He said, there's absolutely no sign of any kind of prostate cancer. You say, that's just happenstance. No. I'm telling you, no. Uh-uh. My God stepped in to what would be a very serious situation. And he said, I can. I can. I can. And I said, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the doctor report says. I just care what Jesus will do. Hallelujah. And for some reason, I feel like there's some folks in this place right now that you've got some negative reports and the prognosis is not all that good for you. But I have news for you. You need to say, I don't care. I don't care. There is a name that is above every name. Hallelujah. And when we pray in the name of Jesus, something begins to happen. The blood of Jesus, when applied, has healing and virtue in it. Hallelujah. I tell you, I do not care what the world says. I put my trust in Jesus. Would you stand right now? Hallelujah. 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 Huria sando ramashonde riando ramashondo ramarabahaya. Hitore yashondo riana lamoshondo ramahaya. I feel like there is a miracle in this house. Hallelujah. There's a miracle in this house. Hitore hesika ronda ramasito rehara raboshatarabahaya. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This miracle is in this house not because of any of us, but it's because of who this house is dedicated to. Hallelujah. It is dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Is there anybody here? Your faith has been belittled. Your faith has just been almost destroyed. The negative voices of doom and gloom have tried to discourage you so much. And you're here. And you're still just a little bit afraid right now to step out. I come against fear right now in the name of Jesus. I come against fear in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. 
I rebuke fear right now. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I don't care. 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 I don't care what the voices say. My faith, my trust is in the one who is able, who is able, who is able, who is able. Hallelujah. 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 I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's a miracle in this house. There's a miracle in this house. There's a miracle in this house. Musharia tarabashatariya tarabashatali alabariya tarabositiya tarabora bahaya.